Hi, good morning everyone. Welcome to the first of the um, Flow Chemistry webinars that we're going to be running here at Cirrus. Um, today we're going to be talking about or giving an introduction to Flow Chemistry and its first principles and we're we'll talking about its, um, its, its comparisons between traditional batch techniques and this new technique of flow which we're going to be introducing here. Um, so before we start just a brief view on Cirrus. I'm not going to go into too much details because if you've logged in for this webinar then you would have been to our website and you'll have seen what we're about. So Cirrus is part of the Black Trace group. Cirrus is the chemistry brand of Black Trace. Uh, we were founded in 2001. Um, Cirrus is the longest established flow chemistry company. We, could, we produced or commercialized the first flow chemistry system 15 years ago. So we've got plenty of expertise and understanding in this area and hopefully across the course of these webinars um, we'll be able to impart our knowledge and instruct you on the ideas and principles of flow chemistry. So we're based in the UK in Royston, um, very close to uh, Cambridge, so we have ties with lots of academic institutes around this area. So I've got the agenda up on the screen here. Um, today we're going to run through the very basics. Um, we're going to have an introduction to flow chemistry um, just to get everyone on board with a general understanding of what the technique is um, and how it can help us with our chemistry, how it can help us control our reaction conditions. Uh, we're going to talk about a little about, very touch break, briefly onto the types of chemistry that we can access. Um, if there are any questions throughout this um, session, please use the question button um, on your uh, go to uh, webinar section. Um, if there are any common questions as we go along, um, I'll have the opportunity to pause and answer, address some of these questions. I have a colleague that's taking notes as we go through. Um, I'll be able to help us. And at the end of this session, feel free to ask as many questions as you like. So as I said, this is the first of the, of the, the sessions that we're going to run. Um, we're going to be covering more of the benefits of flow chemistry and the applications applied to those as we go forward. So just a brief introduction about me. My name is Andrew Mansfield. Um, I head uh, or in charge of flow chemistry products at Cirrus. Um, I have had over 10 years experience um, in running flow chemi chemistry experiments in both industry academic collaborations and in the commercial sector as well so hopefully um, I can impart some of my some of my learning over the top last 10 years to you so uh, before we start I just want to run a quick poll um, so my colleagues just going to put this up on the screen so just a few questions I just want to understand just to get a baseline of basic understanding of, of what kind of experience what level of knowledge you have about flow chemistry before we start so if you just spend a minute just to tick one of those boxes and just let us know where you are on this on this little journey. Okay, I think the polls are coming in. Okay, brilliant. So it looks like everyone is has kind of a a mid list function. Um, am I back on the screen? Okay, sorry. Uh, so the polls are in. Most people, it's a 30 50 split between a little, I've read around the subject, and some exposed to it at work at university. Okay, well, that's a good place to start. So as I go through, this will give everyone a, um, we'll get everyone on the same page. So in future sessions, we can go into more depth. Right, okay, so let's go on. So what is flow chemistry? Let's start from the beginning. To start from the beginning, I think we need to kind of recap on what we already know. So I've got a picture up here of a modern synthetic laboratory. Everyone will have worked or works in this kind of environment. We have nice fume hoods, fume hoods for increased safety to extract all our unwanted media and vapors. Um, if you look closely in there, we have common chemistry apparatus. We have columns, we have round bottom flasks, we have heater stirrers. But if we go down the years, okay, this is in the 1950s from a teaching laboratory, we may have lost fume hoods, may have lost some of those safety aspects, but we're still using the same 
basic apparatus. If we go back further, you can see there's another teaching laboratory. Um, we're still using flasks and columns and you know all, all of those chemistry friendly and familiar um, apparatus. If we go back even further, um, you can see this apparatus that was being used a couple of hundred years ago is still familiar to us. Now, if we compare with a modern laboratory, there's not much different. We have better ways of heating, better ways of, of, of working out materials up, but we're still fundamentally using round bottom flasks to carry out our chemistry. So, what's flow chemistry? Before I start, I just I want to emphasize, and I always emphasize this, that flow chemistry is purely a synthetic technique. It's another tool in our toolbox. It enables us to perform the chemistry that we want to perform. It's not adding anything, any, anything different from the chemistry we want to do. It's not going to give us a brand new molecule, but flow chemistry is a very good tool for increasing the control of our key reaction parameters. So we can control our re reaction conditions with more accuracy. And if we can do that, we can generally be more selective, we can increase yields, we can decrease byproducts, and we can garner all of those advantages that we want to do with better, with better synthesis or carry out better, um, more efficient chemical reactions. So the types of parameters we're looking at when we control a chemical reaction are generally the same across the board. We want to look at controlling factors such as temperature, mixing, the amount of material that we're reacting, and stoichiometric ratios. Um, if we can enhance control of those types of parameters, um, we can access a wide range of applications and benefits. And that's all we're doing with flow chemistry. So let's go from the top. Flow chemistry, in its simplest, its simplest definition would be a system where reagents are continuously pumped through a reactor, creating a product which is continuously eluted and collected. That's all we're doing. So I have a little uh, cartoon up here which illustrates that. So this is a very simple system. We have A and B reacting. So we're pumping A and B into a, into a system. So if we know the concentrations of A and B, and we can vary the flow rates of those going into the systems, we can vary the amount that's going in, and we can control their molar ratios, that stoichiometric ratio of material, extremely precisely. So those reactants, A and B, they're flown into our system, and they meet, they come into contact at some point, they mix. So that could be a very simple T-piece mixer, or if we wanted to increase mass transfer, that could be something more convoluted, like a static mixer. Okay, so they've come into contact, they've mixed, and then we flow our reactants, our mixed reactants, down a temperature controlled um, capillary, a tube pathway. This is that flow reactor. And as they're continuously pumped in, they're continuously reacted, and they continuously elute. Now, one of the major points of um, flow chemistry is that we're not limited to the amount of material we collect. So we can collect for a small time. Um, if we're only interested in data or creating small amounts of material, or we can just continue pumping, we're continually pumping longer to collect more material. Now, the best analogy to, to describe this is from a single tap, I can fill, a, I can fill a, a cup, a cup or glass. If I keep that tap running, I can fill a bath or a swimming pool. It was that principle that we're working on. It's a continuous process. So flow chemistry is a continuous process. So before we start, um, I know some of you have read around the subject, but why do we want to do this in the first place? Then we're all familiar with the traditional ways of carrying out our chemistry. So why, why do we want to change? So I'm not going to go into the key benefits, and, I, and I'm going to pull a few up here um, of in any detail, because we're going to cover that in the next session with worked examples, um, just to highlight these in more detail. But these are kind of whys, and I'm going to run through these quite quickly. Um, and these are all potential benefits. So we can achieve faster reactions. We can increase reaction rates. We can generally increase the safety profile of our reaction. We can make, we can make our reactions safer. We can do faster reaction optimization for method development. 
Um, we can, and I've just thrown this one out there, potentially achieve reaction conditions that aren't possible on traditional techniques. And this is pretty key. Some nice examples as we go forward in this course that illustrates this point. Because we can control our reaction conditions, we can generally be more selective with our chemistry, um, which saves time, effort, and money. Um, We have bigger reactors that pump faster and collect lots more material, and we'll cover that as well. Um, we can have inline workup, so we can take out extraction processes and have them running continuously as well. And we can easily integrate reaction analysis. So anyway, along our reaction pathway, we can understand what's going on with our reaction. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to flow and why we want to do it. But to understand the technique, we really have to go back and compare what we're doing at the moment. So, pull the slide up here. This is a traditional batch, how we carry out reactions in either a round bottom flask or a jacketed reactor of some description, or a bucket, if the chemistry is simple enough. So we all know how to perform this chemistry. We take our reactants, we put them in a vessel, we add a reagent or whatever, we heat the vessel, we stir it, we leave it for a while to react. Then we need to take the contents of that vessel out, work it up, and extract the material that we need. We're thinking about when we're running reactions under batch conditions, we're thinking about things like reaction time, the length of time it takes, the temperature that we need to maintain the reactor, mixing, stoichiometric ratios, and concentrations. So we're all familiar with this. So flow reactors, and this is another simple kind of cartoon of a flow reactor where we're adding A and B. So here, we're doing something slightly differently, but we're still carrying out the same chemistry. We're pumping our reagents continuously into a flow reactor. They mix, they react in a reactor, and they're eluted. We still need to work them up and isolate them, and we still need to think about those same reaction conditions that we would think about traditionally. We're still thinking about temperature, um, reaction times, mixing, stoichiometric ratios. I mean, here in, uh, under one of the flow chemistry definitions that we'll cover in a second is residence time. But that's analogous with the reaction time. So you can see we have another parameter in here, which is pressure. And we'll cover this, we'll cover this as we go forward this morning. Now, pressure is a key factor, one of the key advantages of running systems in flow, chemis flow chemistry, uh, under flow chemistry techniques. So there, the similarities and the, and the factors that we, we, we'd like to think about. What do we need for a flow chemistry system though? So we've seen that we have something pumping into a tube and into a reactor. Well, what does that look like? What do we need to run a flow chemistry experiment? So the first requirement is a pump. We need a pump to introduce our reagents. Now the pump is arguably the most important part of a flow chemistry system. If we don't have confidence in the flow rates that we're pumping out, and, and that pump can pump accurately um, under a wide range of chemical compatibilities, then all of these advantages we're talking about, controlling molar ratios and reaction times, just disappear. So the pump is, is key. We need something that is reliable, has a wide dynamic range of flow rates. Then we need to flow into a flow reactor. That reactor needs to be highly chemical compatible. We need to be able to do the same types of chemistry that we would do in traditional round bottom flask. Ideally, that should be able to handle a wide range of temperature ranges, and we should ideally be able to see into our reactor as well as we would do. You can see color changes or gas evolution. So flow reactors. Now I've said we can apply pressure into a system, so having a method of applying back pressure regulation is key as well for lots of um, to, to to benefit lots to, to achieve lots of the benefits that flow chemistry can offer and then we need to collect the material out at the end so we can do that manually or we can apply things like um, automated collectors or fraction collectors for collecting serial multiple reactions in one automated process now as i said we're not we're not limited to the amount that we can collect we can collect milligrams we can collect kilograms from the same system. So that all needs to be connected together um, into some kind of fluidic pathway. It's okay having these modules in, these modules in isolation, 
So I just put up a little schematic here. This is, comes off of our software, which is showing we have pumps. So we have two channels, A and B. It's flowing into a system where we can introduce our reagents into a micro reactor chip. We're applying some back pressure and we're connecting. So that'd be a very simple fluidic pathway. Um, but what does that look like in real life? So I'm just going to snap forwards a little bit um, just to show you a simple system. Just waiting for my glamorous assistant to zoom in. There we go. So to run a flow chemistry experiment, all we need is a pump. So we've got a pump here with two channels, so we can flow our A and B directly from the bottle, the vial. We want to flow into a flow reactor. So this module here allows us to heat and cool a simple um, glass micro reactor. Then we apply some back pressure. This is all we need to run that simple experiment and, and, and access flow chemistry. Now this is all stackable. This will take up no more space than the standard uh, hip hot plate stirrer and our reaction, our Ramon class reaction setup in a standard few minutes. Okay. So I've said all we need to do a simple reaction. Um, to uh, a simple reaction where we have A plus B going into a single reaction step. That's just mimicking that system that we've just seen. So you can see just a little, a quick, a quick picture, a quick, quick photograph of that. If you can see um, that zoomed in image, um, so we have a, a simple pump, we have one reactor, and we have some back pressure. Very simple systems. Now, if you've read around flow chemistry, um, and we'll cover this in more detail with multi-step telescope reactions in, in future webinars, but as your experience, your knowledge, and your kind of requirements develop we can start to perform more complex processes. So we can access things like multi-step telescope reactions, where one reaction will feed into the next, will feed into, the, into, into another, where we can create reactive intermediates or our hazardous um, stars and materials in situ and use them immediately. And we can have multiple temperature zones. As we said, we can have inline workup and analysis, and we can automate that whole process. So we can go from very simple, single-step processes to very, complex multi-step telescope processes. So that are the types of equipment, that's the type of setup we need. Um, so we've spoken about flow reactors. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the apparatus that we're using, but there are generally three types of flow reactors that we would use. Um, and this is ubiquitous. Most of all of these reactors are identical, slightly different. Um, across every flow chemistry platform. We have the Cirrus one here, but any, any flow system will do the same thing. It's still made up of a pump, a reactor, some back pressure, and some connection, and some fancy stuff in between, if you like, but that's the simplest setup. So the first reactor that we might use is a glass micro reactor. So this is a, an, an etched tube, uh, uh, sorry, an etched glass plate. So one here, if you, that focuses, quite difficult. So this is a one milliliter reactor. It's got three inputs. So we have three input streams, one output stream. Um, so we'd use something of this size where we want to generate smaller amounts of material. We have a, a, a lower throughput. So we might use this for applications where we need a small amount of material or for reaction optimization and method development. If we want to scale up and produce more material, then we'd use a tubular reactor. Now this is a PTFE reactor. It has a PTFE tube, a capillary, wrapped around the heating mantle, so we can temperature control this. This has a larger volume than that micro reactor, so we can have a higher throughput to generate more material. We can have all of these reactors in different media, by the way. This is PTFE. It could be stainless steel or hasteloid for better chemical compatibility. If we want to then start looking at heterogeneous type applications, we can use a simple packed bed reactor. This is a, sorry, I'm trying to get in front of the camera. There we go, my body behind it. So this is a simple glass column that we can pack with our heterogeneous media, whether that's a, a supported reagent, catalyst, enzyme, for example, or a solid material itself, where we can flow the enzyme through the, sorry, flow out substrate through the column and react on the surface. So they're the three types of columns, three types of reactors that we typically use under flow conditions, 
or in a flow experiment. Okay, so we kind of understand where batch and flow fit together. We're still performing the same chemistry, but hopefully just with that initial discussion, we can see that we can control reaction parameters in a little bit more detail. So let's go through um, those four um, key factors that we're thinking about when we're running an experiment under a continuous conditions. So we're going to be going through residence time, mixing, pressure and temperature and highlighting the how it complements and how it differs from running under traditional techniques. So let's start off with residence time. So this is going to be very simple, hopefully. So residence time, what is residence time? As I said, it's analogous to the reaction time in a batch reactor. And it can be described simply as the time that every fraction of our reaction spends in that flow reactor. And we've just seen flow reactors. So it's every time that, the, the point of time where our reaction enters and exits that flow reactor. So it's a very simple calculation. Um, residence time is equivalent to the reaction time in batch. If we consider a flow reactor, yeah, whether it's a micro reactor or a tubular reactor, our reaction enters and exits. And it's that ratio of volume to flow rate that governs that residence time. So it's calculated simply as the reactor volume divided by the flow rate that we're pumping into the system. Now we can alter that, those factors in a couple of ways. So we can control that residence time very simply by changing the reactor volume or varying the flow rates. Simple calculation. We can also control the molar ratio, as we said earlier. If we know the, the concentration of the solutions that, that we're entering or we're pumping into our system, by varying those flow rates, we can control the, 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 the molar ratios, the, the stoichiometric ratios of our reaction. So just to underpin that kind of first principle, just have a little works example here. And there's, a, there's a, another poll just to try and make this look interactive so you're not just looking at me. Um, so I have a simple system. Now we've described the system previously. We have two reagents, A and B. They're flowing into a one milliliter glass micro reactor at 0.25 milliliters per minute flow rate each. Now that's the setup we're using. So a quick poll, what would be the rest of this time? So just spend a, a few minutes having to think about that. Hopefully you can see that poll. Come on, it's a simple question. if you've got that answer. Um, what I wanted to point out is it's two minutes. Well done everyone that got that right. What I wanted to point out, the thing that we need to consider is that we have two input streams. We have A plus B, so it's a combined flow rate. So our combined flow rate running into the reactor is 0.5 milliliters per minute. So there we go, simple calculation, volume um, divided by flow rate, we have the residence time. Now that's quite easy for an A plus B system, but if we had multiple input puts and then a telescope system, then those calculations get a little bit, a little bit harder. So I'm not going to take the poll on this one. Um, next question would be, and I generally do this in workshops and get a little bit more involved, but this is quite high level. What could we do to increase the residence time to eight minutes? So simply, we could decrease the flow rates, so the flow rates down, or we can increase the reaction volume. It's quite easy. Now. This is a simple calculation if our reagents are equal molar, and here we have a one-to-one -one ratio. But if we start changing concentrations and changing molar ratios, 
um, then those calculations uh, become a little bit more complex. Now, in this example where we're running um, a one-to-one -one stoichiometric ratio of equal concentrations, that's easy. If we wanted to run a one-to-two molar ratio, then we just alter the flow rate ratio to one-to-two. It's as simple as that to control the molar ratios of our reagents entering into the system. Okay, so that's all I was going to say about residence time. We need to understand how long our reaction spends in that flow reactor. So the next thing I want to talk about is mixing. Mixing under batch conditions is turbulent. It's chaotic. It's never going to be the same. We can increase the mixing um, potential by putting baffles into our reactor, having multiple impellers, um, stirring faster. We can create better mixing um, environment. But that's always going to be different. It's not constant. So if you think about a um, an application in a general batch reactor where we're dropping, where we're having a dropwise addition, we're always going to have a different ratio of our A meeting B. Just going to be less B over here, more B, a, B up, sorry, more uh, A and B up here. So we generate concentration gradients, which can lead to unwanted pathways because of this turbulent mixing. Now I've got a little diagram here that just shows turbulence in a pipe. You know, that's just to show you those whirls and eddies that we generate with turbulent mixing. Now under flow conditions, we can have both turbulent and laminar flow mixing. Um, the, the difference or the, the transition between turbulent through to laminar is governed by a number of variables. We're thinking about things like viscosity and flow rate and the size, the inner di diameter of the tube that we're using. Now, the larger the diameter, the more our system leads towards turbul turbulent flow. But under most laboratory scale flow systems, we're looking at laminar flow. Laminar flow is a constant mixing process. We're mixing by actual radial diffusion, which means that the stoichi stoichiometry of our reactants anywhere in our flow reactor is always the same. We eliminate back mixing and we can have precise reproducible mixing of our reagents. So that's illustrated a bit further here. Uh, as I said, we can create turbulent flow, we can increase the size of the tube. Or as I said previously, we can use things like static mixers. If we need really fast mass transfer for those fast reactions that we may want to carry out, such as a, an organometallic or an exothermic type reaction, we can create convoluted mixing processes to create very fast turbulent static mixes. So here we just have one of our micro mixers where we split and recombine the flow streams to create very efficient mixing. But if we think about laminar flow in a bit more detail, um, laminar flow um, occurs, or is laminar, uh, the diffusion rate is proportional to the distance squared. So over short distances, our diffusion is fast and reproducible. Now this increases with the, the size, the diameter of the tubing that we use. Um, but you can see in this diagram here, we don't mix constantly. Uh, so we don't mix immediately. We diffuse our reagents into one another. Now, if we're using the same flow rates and the same concentrations and the same flow uh, flow chemistry setup, this will always be, be, be reproducible. So every part of our reaction is seeing the same mixing regime, seeing the same stoichiometry, and then that will continue through our reactor. And you can see in a process like this, we eliminate that mixing because we're moving our reagents forward all the time. So that's mixing. This is a, a, a key way of us getting, gaining more control of our reaction conditions. Okay, so there are two of those principles. Let's think about how temperature is affected by running a flow chemistry experiment. So, the first thing I wanted to, to say about a flow reactor, and we've seen these, is that we generally have a much greater surface area to volume ratio. That means we have, we have more surface of the reactor where we can apply heat or take heat away. Now, I've got a, a, a couple of um, um, examples here Maybe not the right models, but we've got the volume and the surface area of a sphere, 
compared with that of a cylinder or a tube, which is what we're essentially using, whether that's etched into a glass plate or it's a long length of tubing that we're using. Um, okay, if we think about a steer, we're probably not going to be using the whole volume. We're probably only going to fill out round bottle flask halfway, but this still illustrates the point. So if we take one milliliter, the surface area of that sphere is 4.8 centimeters squared. If we compare that with a tube of a capillary reactor, so we give that capillary a, a one millimeter in a diameter, the surface area of the equivalent surface area is 40 centimeters cubed. If we reduce that inner diameter, that increases even further. So you can see we have a much surface, a much greater surface area to volume compared with the batch reactor that gives us a few advantages. So we have a surf high surface area. If we have a high surface area, we have better heat transfer. So we have better temperature control. Um, our reactions can cool down and heat up extremely rapidly. You know, it says, I'm going to say faster than the microwave, comparable with the microwave vessel. So if you think about heating a batch reactor, um, what we do, generally, we're heating from the outside in. So it's going to be hotter on the outside of the reactor initially than it is in the center. With good mixing, that becomes more efficient. But the larger the, 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 larger the vessel we use, the more pronounced that temperature gradient across our reaction is. Also it takes a while to heat up and get to temperature depending on the size of the vessel and the types of solvent we're using. But still, we generate a temperature gradient. And if we're talking about reaction control, having a homogeneous temperature, the ideal reaction temperature for us to perform our chemistry at would be the ideal. If we have a temperature range, that could possibly lead, if it's a thermodynamic process, to unwanted byproducts. Now, when our reagents, our reactants, enter our flow reactor, because we have that high surface area, they immediately get to the desired volume that we've set. And, and um, conversely, when they exit the reactor, that heat dissipation allows that temperature to rapidly drop down to um, the, the environmental temperature. So we can illustrate that a little bit further here. So we have better temperature control. Under flow conditions, that's generally more homogeneous. So we can have better selectivity. Now, I've pulled up a simple energy uh, graph here um, where we have two reaction pathways, one given C, one given E. Now, just to illustrate that, again, under batch conditions where we have a broad temperature distribution, temperature gradient, that can potentially give rise to that unwanted activation energy and our unwanted um, material, E. Now, we can control that temperature range very precisely under flow conditions, which means we get predominance of the, of the, the material we want, the predominance of C, so we can increase our selectivity of our reaction and decrease our amount of byproducts. There's another fact, factor that we consider with, um, te another temperature factor that we can consider with a flow reactor, and that's the ability to take our reactions above their boiling points. So, in a flow reactor, as you've seen, they're typically smaller, they have smaller volumes, because we're not limited, as we said, to the size of our reactor to generate the amount of material we want. We can continuously flow. So from a simple one milliliter reactor, I can leave that flowing 10 liters. That's the comparison we're talking about. So a lot smaller, so it means they're easier to pressurize, much easier to pressurize than the equivalent batch reactor. Now we've all, we may have run pressurized reactions under batch conditions in the past, but we all need, no, we need sealed vessels, generally quite thick, stainless steel pots. Now that can have implied safety issues as well, depending on the temperatures and pressures we want to get to. Now, if we can pressurize the system, uh, we can operate at reaction temperatures above their boiling points. So we've all worked under reflux conditions, we have a condenser, and we're limited to the boiling point of the solvent we'll be using in our, re in, our, in our reaction. Now, if we can pressurize that, we can elevate that above, the, above, its, above its reflux boiling temperature. Now, if we can do that, we can add more energy into our system and generally speed up reaction rates. Again, if we talk about thermodynamically controlled uh, experiments. 
So that's quite a nice segue into looking at that last parameter, the last of those four parameters that, we're, that we were going to discuss, that being pressure. So we've said our reactors are smaller, they can be easily pressurized. Um, in a flowing system, we generate pressure um, in, in two ways. So the first way is by um, by actually physically pumping into a, into a system. Uh, we generate pressure by pumping our reagents into our flowing system, into our, into our fluid in there. So that would increase, if we increase flow rates, the velocity of the material we're pumping. If we have narrower channels, or if we have more viscous liquid, we just need more energy. Uh, we need more pressure to be able to pump those uh, increasing, increasing, dip, increasingly difficult methods. We can also, in a flow system, apply back pressure intentionally. So we can apply a restriction to flow on a flow system, which, which will impart pressure all the way through that system from input to collection. We generally do this with a back pressure regulator at the end of the system, so we can intentionally apply pressure. So this can give us quite a few advantages. Um, we'll cover these with examples in later sessions, but it means we can now start to continuously access chemistry that evolve gas or add gas in. So gas insertions, type chemistries, hydrogenations, carbonylations, oxidations, those types of things we can do under pressure continuously without being limited to a size, uh, size static vessel. And we can also start to access chemistries that evolve gas. So we're talking about rearrangement chemistries like Curtius and Schmitz and those types of things. We have, we have a pressurized system, we can help maintain that gas evolved in the flowing system because we have smaller reactors, smaller amounts of material reacting at any one point. We're not generating huge amounts of gas for a, for a large scale reaction of that type. So pressure can be applied for the gas type reactions. We can also use it to avoid cavitation, where we have volatile materials. And as we've said earlier, we can take our materials way above their reflux temperatures. So let's take that a little bit further forward. So higher pressures enable higher temperatures. Higher temperatures can result in faster reaction rates. Um, so we illustrate that point of um, being able to take our, our solvents above their reflux temperatures. I've just got a graph here with three common solvents. We've got dichloromethane, methanol, and water. We all know water at one atmosphere boils 100 degrees. If we can apply pressure, we can take that boiling point a lot higher. I mean, you can see DCM here. Even at 17 bar, we can, we can run a, a dichloromethane reaction at 150 degrees, whether you want to, I don't know, but it's just to illustrate that point. Now, if we take that a step further, if you remember back to your physical chemistry days, the Arrhenius equation essentially says, with every 10 degree rise in temperature, we double our reaction rate and reduce half our reaction time. So if we can increase our reaction temperature 100 degrees, we can potentially run a reaction a thousand times faster. Potentially, you know, this is hypothetical. But we see lots of benefits, and there are lots of examples where we can see reactions that may run, that may take hours under batch conditions, going down to tens of minutes, tens of minutes down to seconds. So we can start to do some process intensification of our, uh, of our reactions as well. So that's covering pressure. So we've covered those four principles. What types of chemistry can we perform in a typical flow chemistry system? Now, I'm not talking application examples, whether that's you know, pumping butyl lithium or doing polymerizations or whatever, it's the, the phases that we do we operate at. So most flow chemistry applications on a lab scale, in an ideal, would be homogeneous. That being our reagents, our products, our byproducts are all soluble. Now remember we are pumping through, on a lab scale, small capillaries. So if our chemistry starts to precipitate or create salts, cause insoluble products or byproducts, there is the possibility of clogging a capillary reactor. 
So the ideal would be monophasic. We can run in a homogeneous, homogeneous situation um, biphasic reactions as well. This lends itself extremely well to flow chemistry because we're generally creating that biphase as very small droplets. So we're increasing the surface area. And there are examples where we have where we've shown we can accelerate biphasic reactions by creating small droplets or emulsions in a flow system. Now, if we want to access heterogeneous chemistry, now, I said earlier that pumping solids or generating solids in the capillary um, is, 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 is bad, essentially. On a lab scale, we're using small capillaries, so there is a more, there's a greater chance for that to happen. Well, when we start to go up in scale um, and start to use equipment for um, chelo manufacturing, uh, creating more material, we're using larger diameter tubing. So we can change the engineering and we can start to handle solids, sorry, slurries and suspensions a bit easier. Um, if you introduce a slurry into a flow system, um, ideally that should react so you have a homogeneous output, um, or you will generally have, a, have an issue with some point of restriction in your system which will lead to clogging. That's not to say we can't use, we can't generate solids. We use our flow chemistry systems to make nanoparticles. If the particles are small enough, it's absolutely fine. But anyway, sorry, I'm diverging there a little bit. Um, if we want to use heterogeneous examples, we would generally use them as a pack bed reactor. Now, there are hundreds of examples of people using um, pack bed reactors to house supported media, supported reagents, catalyst enzymes, where we flow our substrate over our supported media and reacting on the surface. There's lots of nice chemistry that's emerging at the moment where people are filling columns with solid media. Now you can use a, a packed reactor to form zinc case in situ, the most extreme. There's some nice examples coming through using those type of applications. We can access gas and liquid um, chemistry as I, as I described earlier. We can introduce gas into the system and we combine all of those processes to do those triphasic gas and solid reactions. So that's all I was going to cover in the kind of general introduction. But what I wanted to say here um, is that flow chemistry may be new to lots of lots of chemists, but it is a technique, a synthetic technique that's been adopted. Adop adop get out of it adopted significantly over the last 10 years. It's almost become ubiquitous in certain industries. There are thousands of literature examples that aren't confined, confined to niche journals. Now, as we said right at the top, all we're doing is giving you a new and another synthetic technique into your toolbox to allow you to control react your reaction parameters in your data. So if it's good chemistry, the chemistry we use the right apparatus for the right, um, the right, the right job. So it will be published in a decent journal, any fancy jobs, jacks. If you put flow or continuous as a keyword in front of any named reaction, you will pull up lots of examples. Um, so have a further read around that. So, um, and the last thing I wanted to say here is that the range of applications that flow has been used in is vast. You know. My background is a as a traditional organic synthetic chemist. That's that's what I know. That's where I've used flow in most applications. But we can use it for material chemistries. We can use it for making and controlling polymer sizes, for creating monodispersed nanoparticles and quantum blocks, for making metal organic framework, etc. Um, it's been used in the flavors and flavors in, industry. So you know, small volatile materials being made in a sealed system is an ideal application. Um, oil and petrol additives, uh, paints and textiles. You know, the, the range of users of this application is growing um, extraordinarily. So I'd like to finish up there. Um, we have covered, I think, a, an introduction to flow chemistry. So we know what flow chemistry is now. We know how it compares with the techniques that we use um, traditionally, batch, um, and now this new technique of flow to a lot of people. Um, we've discussed about those 
parameters that we need to think about when we're operating or we're setting up a flake chemistry experiment and how they can help us, they can enhance um, our capabilities to control our reaction, uh, our reaction conditions. And we talked about the, the types of chemistry that we can perform. Now, on future sessions, we're going to be covering those benefits that I went through quickly to begin with, with worked examples. So I can describe, I will be describing to you how reactions can be made safer, how we can speed up our reactions. Um, so that's the next session. And before we go on to the question and answers, um, that next session will be in three weeks. Um, where we chemistry and flow in more detail. So if you look at your um, look at the website or you look at your inbox over the next few weeks or the next few days, you're going to have an invite into that if you want to come along. Future sessions will be covering techniques of transitioning batch to flow and then looking at more, more oh, applications in specific applications in more detail. So hopefully you can come back for some more of those sessions. So um, the question boxes have been open throughout this. Um, I think we have some questions in. So if we just pause and, and I can answer some of the questions that have, that have come in um, while I've been talking. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you talked about reagents A and B. Can they be liquid and gas? So first question, um, reactions A and B, can they be a liquid and a gas? Um, yes. So we can feed gases into a flow reactor to create that gas liquid partition that I showed. Um, it's a really nice application actually. Um, you do need a mass flow controller of some description or a, regu a, fine, a regulator with fine control. You need to have a balance of slightly more gas and system pressure, slightly, slightly higher gas pressure than system pressure, but you create that gas liquid pipe phase. And it's a really nice method if you're using a reactor that you can see inside, such as a PTFD or a glass micro reactor, because you can see when your reaction is gas limited. So you have a gas liquid partition, and when it's gas limited, it's just liquid. So you know you need to increase more your gas pressure to drive that reaction forward. So yes, we can have A and B as gas. And we can have A and B as gas feeding in to a column. So we can use a heterogeneous catalyst to, to take that step further. Uh, just an extension of that, what is the use of the back pressure regulator? Can it be used for gas liquid flow? So the, 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 the second question that I've just been forwarded is um, what's the use of the, of the back pressure regulator? So the back pressure regulator creates the pressure in our flowing stream to the point of excess. So um, if we're generating gases or putting gases in, it will be that that's helping maintain that gas either in a liquid state or as a, as a partition. It helps it um, it helps us pump against the flow system. If we had, if we were, into, if we were putting gas into a flow system where we're creating that A plus B gas liquid partition, and we had no resistance, then the effect would be the gas would just push the contents of our reactor out, and we'd have no control over the flow rate through the system. So we need some resistance to help us maintain a known flow rate through our system of that gas and liquid. And the last question here, uh, we commonly run reactions with inorganic bases, for example, sodium and potassium, uh, in organic solvents with partial solubility. Would the common reactors be the appropriate medium for this type of reaction? Is there a potential for dissolved base to precipitate out and cause blockages of the common? Okay, so there's a question in here about using um, inorganic bases. In a, in a flowing system. Um, so the question was, can we can we pack those into a, in a column and use those in a, in a flowing system? And, sorry, I'm just gonna read this myself. Yeah, okay, so if we're using an organic basis, um, and that chemistry can handle, or isn't hydrolyzable, there's no reason why we can't control, why we can't dissolve that inorganic base as a as an input as a feedstock, and that's done that's done in lots of examples. You know, water is miscible in lots of solvents. You can use DMF, acetonitrile, etc. 
and a 10% aqueous to organic ratio is generally fine for dissolving in organic bases. If it's an issue with your chemistry and water content is undesirable, um, then you can maybe adopt your chemistry, you can swap your inorganic base for an organic base, which is what you have to do occasionally when you're doing a batch to flow conversion. You can't always translate a batch condition directly to flow. It might need some modification. You could pack, as, as the, 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 question, the person who answered, uh, asked, asked this question said, you could use a pack bed column. Now, the problem of just using a solid in a column is that it will deplete. As we're running our reagent or our reactant through the column, we're going to create fines, we're going to dissolve some of that material in there, so it will have a finite life. Um, you have to choose the right solvent selectivity to prevent that dissolution um, creating problems further downstream. Um, what, I would, what I typically do if I'm doing that type of application is you can mix your supported, uh, sorry, your solid media with something that's inert. So as your reactant, uh, sorry, as your solid is being depleted, that inert media is helping repack the column, so we're not creating fines or channeling. Now to say that, that so on to its uh, next logical conclusion, we can still use metals, um, things like uh, zinc and magnesium, um, for creating you know, green yards and zincates in flow, where we can pack them in a column. Um, obviously, you're not going to want to play around with activated magnesium and zinc, but because we have a sealed system, you can activate those in situ and then pass your, your media through. So there are lots of literature examples where people are using those type of applications. Hopefully that helps. Okay, another question. Someone's asked, uh, what is the maximum temperature and pressure that you can commonly reach with low temperature systems? So maximum temperatures and pressures. Um, so depends on the media you're using. So um, glass columns, they can withstand high temperatures and pressures. 250 degrees, 20 bar, I would say, is a, is a nice working, safe working limit for pressure. PTFE reactors, I show. PTFE is a polymer, so that's going to creep at, high, at elevated temperatures and pressures. And the last thing you want to do is take that above its operating conditions. So we generally limit PTFE to um, 125 degrees and 20 bar. And if you want to go to the higher temperatures with tubular reactors, then you'd use uh, a metal, a stainless steel or a hasteloid. So 250 degrees, um, and if we had a system that was fully, uh, that had stainless steel tubing, you can take those systems to huge, to elevated temperatures uh, and pressures. Uh, the Thales Nano HQ, for example, will operate at 150 degrees, uh, sorry, 200 degrees up to 100 bar pressure, um, which is more than adequate for hydrogenation type examples. But typically in a versatile flow chemistry system, we're operating at temperatures down to minus 100 and up to 250 degrees and around 20 bar. You know, if, we look at, if you look at that table of vapor pressure against temperature, um, 20 bar of pressure is more than adequate to allow you to operate above the reflux temperatures of, of, of most media. So we have other questions, but they're quite specific. So if we will follow up with people. Okay. So I'll just be told that some of the other questions are a little bit more application specific. So what we'll do is we'll take those questions offline and we'll get back to the people that have asked them uh, because they're a little bit more depth to, to describe. So um, if we'll, fin we'll finish the first session off there. So I hope you've all learned something. Um, ideally, this session is to get everyone on the, on the same page so we can then talk in further detail um, about the benefits of flow, certain applications and how we might apply them. And we'll talk about some chemistries in, in, in more detail. So um, put the date in your diary for the next session, the 3rd of October, um, where we'll carry on from here. Um, when this session closes, um, there will be a feedback form um, that pops up. Uh, 
I don't know, no one likes filling out feedback forms. But this will help us in making these sessions better in the future. So I'll take you a minute to, to fill out a uh, question and I'll uh, tick box type of thing. So anyway, thank you for your um, for your time. I hope that was useful. Um, and I'll see you next time.